1984, the toy world as we know it took a seismic shift with the introduction of transforming robots, heroic, noble, and civilized Autobots who were locked in a perpetual conflict over the procurement of energy resources with their evil counterparts, the battle-hardened and ruthless Decepticons. In today's video, we look at the evolution of the original generation's characters, beginning with the inception of the toy line and its prehistory, before we see how it evolved into modern and equally collectible toy forms. Some of the material found in this video can be credited to Pablo Hidalgo's 2011 Transformers Vault book, as well as the Japanese printed 2001 Transformers Generation Guidebook, as well as comics, cartoon, and my own personal collecting experience over the years. We will focus primarily on the Generation 1 characters and the evolution of the figure designs and aesthetics over the years, though there will be some mention of other series as well. So, let's dive in. While many good stories begin with an origin, the technical development details of Transformers is in of itself an origin story as well. It begins at Hasbro, makes its way overseas before ultimately ending up back at Hasbro headquarters in Rhode Island yet again. The name Hasbro originates from the Hassenfeld brothers, who founded the company in the 1920s based on their surname and relationship to one another, hence Hasbro. It wasn't until 1964 that America's fighting man and first recognized action figure, the 12-inch G.I. Joe, took Hasbro to a new level. Meanwhile, in Japan, Takara licensed the G.I. Joe mold and basic design from Hasbro for their Henshin Cyborg line. The Henshin Cyborg was later downscaled for Takara's Microman line, and then Microman spun off into two toy lines in 1980, namely Microchange as well as Diaclone. Microchange consisted of transforming robots that transformed into everyday household items such as tape decks, microscopes, and cameras, whereas Diaclone focused on transforming cars and planes, with the original Henshin Cyborg body being further downscaled as pilots for the Diaclone vehicles. Hasbro later licensed Microchange and Diaclone's molds, which formed the characters in the 1984 Transformers series as well as some of the characters in 1985 and 1986. Do you see now how things went full circle? Much of this can be verified through various internet sources as well as documentaries such as The Toys That Made Us. Transformers had a successful North American cartoon that ran from 1984 until its cancellation in 1987 as well as a movie that redefined the term called Classic. In Japan, the cartoon continued until 1989 with full seasons of Headmasters, Master Force, and Victory, and included one-off specials such as Zone and Scramble City. The toy line continued until 1991 before being discontinued, though some releases continued in Europe until 1992. Transformers also had an 80-issue Marvel Comics run, with most of its stories written by Bob Budiansky and Simon Furman. Transformers did make a comeback in 1993, newly branded as Generation 2. This choice of name retroactively made the previous series referred to as Generation 1. Generation 2 saw some recolors of G1 characters as well as some new molds before being discontinued in 1995. The G2 cartoon used the same episodes and footage as its G1 predecessor, albeit with a revised theme song and a cybernetic space cube to transition between scenes. G2 was then discontinued in 1995. In 1996, a new Transformers series called Beast Wars gave the franchise a new jolt of life, albeit presented in a completely different form. Consisting of Maximus and Predacons, who were the descendants of the original Autobots and Decepticons, these robots could transform into prehistoric Earth animals rather than machines as their alternate modes. While we did see the use of ball joints and improved articulation used sparingly before the inception of Beast Wars, it was indeed the Beast Wars toy line that did this on a more consistent and wider scale. This use of enhanced articulation is a trend that has continued into modern times. The cartoon and toy line were well received by fans and critics for its deep storytelling and its connection to the G1 series. Beast Wars also retroactively added elements to the original Transformers, such as the official mention and coining of the term Spark which represents a Transformer's soul and essence. They also began referring to the original Generation 1 war as the Great War. Beast Wars continued until 1999 and was succeeded by Beast Machines, which concluded in 2000. Now it is at this point that I will curb the discussion on continuity to focus more on the progression of toys representing G1 characters. I am aware that after Beast Machines, Transformers released several series in both the toy and media forms, such as Robots in Disguise, Armada, Energon, Cybertron, Animated, Prime, Rescue Bots, the live-action movie, etc., but those are beyond the scope of this video's discussion. 
The year 2003 saw a major advancement in Transformers toy history with the release of the MPO-1 Masterpiece Optimus Prime. This high-end, 12-inch figure featured amazing articulation, die-cast parts in its body construction, and served as a faithful updated representation to both the original 1984 toy and cartoon. The Masterpiece series was originally intended as an intermittently released novelty line, with inconsistent scale for its first several figures. However, being a popular line of figures, the Masterpiece series received a soft reboot in 2011, beginning with the MP10 Masterpiece Optimus Prime. With more consistent scale now and more frequently released figures, this series of Masterpiece became a main line for both Hasbro and Takara, rather than serving as occasional special releases only. Despite its high price, Masterpiece releases remain desirable to this day. Similarly, the year 2006 saw a mainline release of the Transformers Classics line, with figures priced within the more familiar and standard price range. While the releases did pay homage to the G1 characters, designs were often updated and sometimes strayed from the original character look. This trend continued in the series of the same era, namely the Hengai, Generations, and Universe series, often shortened to Chug when you combine it with the 2006 Classics line. Though despite the different series names, the figures generally blended very well together on your shelves in terms of scale, quality, and size. The same could be said for the 2016 to 2018 releases, namely Combiner Wars, Titans Return, and Power of the Primes. However, this mainline, mid-priced release that began with the 2006 classics saw a soft reboot similar to what happened with the Masterpiece line. This occurred with the launch of 2019's War for Cybertron Siege figures. The releases were more accurate to the original toy and cartoon models, at least in robot mode. The figures did add a little battle damage aesthetic and Cybertronian vehicle modes in the first launch of this line. 2020 and 21 saw the release of War for Cybertron, Earthrise, and Kingdom figures with a cleaned up aesthetic Earth-like vehicle modes, and the inclusion of some Beast Wars characters. Transformers also switched up their Studio Series release with the sub-brand of Studio 86 to pay homage to the 1986 animated movie. These figures display very well with the concurrent War for Cybertron releases. It should be noted that the War for Cybertron figures are scaled smaller than the prior modern releases, so the Deluxe, Voyager, and Leader Class figures are all downsized, unfortunately with an ongoing increase in price. But hey, at least the figures look nice. Be sure to check out the War for Cybertron Netflix cartoon if you already haven't. To further compound all of this, third-party companies have sprung up over the years, adding figures to fill gaps and sometimes release figures ahead of Takara and Hasbro. While some third-party companies are hit or miss, the better companies have figures that fit in very well with your Masterpiece line as well as your post-2006 modern line that begun with the classic series. I personally am a fan of many of these fan-driven companies, particularly MMC, Fans Toys, Make Toys, and Bad Cube, figures of which I buy for my Masterpiece collection. Now, with everything that I've said here, the point I'm trying to drive home is that there are multiple ways to build your Generation 1 or Generation 1 style collection. Some of you probably already had a clear idea of your collecting methods before you clicked on this video, and there are some factors to consider that have not been mentioned by me here. Some of you are still finding your way and making your decision as you learn more about the Transformers franchise. Some of you may not collect Transformers at all, but are curious to see what's available out there. Either way, build your collection how you see fit, and my best advice to you is to go with what feels most natural and more organic. As for the options out there, perhaps you don't mind the lack of articulation and simply want the earliest representations of the toys you grew up with. I've met many folks who stick to Generation 1 original figures only, with the odd reissue popping up here and there in their collection. Perhaps articulation and modern toy technology is mandatory as a consideration for you, and then you'll stick to modern representations that you find at big box stores, such as War for Cybertron and Studio 86 series. Perhaps you want the boldest shelf presence and the peace of mind that you have the most high-end representation of the figure you can find. In this case, you'll stick to Masterpiece. Or perhaps you'll take some combination of everything that I've mentioned here. As for my personal journey, just so I can say I've shared it here, in some ways, I felt the choice was already made for me when I got back into the collecting hobby as an adult. In the early 2000s, when I wanted to get back into collecting, Generation 1 figures were really the only thing that was available to me at second-hand stores, plus the odd reissue that I would find at places such as Toys R Us. The Masterpiece line was a must-grab for me back when they were only periodic releases, and with only a handful of releases, I didn't have much of a choice but to grab what was out there, albeit... I can say I love the figures all the same since I didn't know how long I would be collecting for. As for the classics or the chug line, they were a fun grab for me until War for Cybertron came out to replace that collection on my shelves. Over the years, I added various third-party figures and thus I ended up with the collection that I have today. Part of me does wonder though if my collection would have gone in a different direction if I had started a little bit later. 
Another part of the excitement, though, is I don't know for sure what direction my collection will take going forward, or what I'll keep, or what I will add. Either way, I'm happy with my collection and how I collect, and whatever direction you decide to take or have been currently taking for your collection, I hope you enjoy it as well in your own way, just as I have. As we come to the end of this video, I do want to say that I am intrigued at what future direction the Transformers franchise will take, be it in the form of toys, the cartoon, comics, or other forms of media and plastic goods. As per usual, if there's something you would like to add or perhaps mention that I haven't considered, please be sure to state your opinion in the comments. Otherwise, that's it for now. I hope this video has been helpful and insightful for those of you watching. Please be sure to subscribe if you already haven't, follow me on Instagram, and I'll see you next time. But most importantly, enjoy your toys. Now in the words of the wise Optimus Prime, transform and roll out.